My name is Jason J. Hamilton. I'm the founder of Keep It Simple Financial Planning. We provide financial planning and investment management services. And today we're going to talk about securing your future. And we're going to talk about a guide to smarter retirement investments. But this is really going to be a general investing workshop that's meant to cover the scope of the brand new investor to a little bit more advanced investor. And I really want to address a few of the biggest questions that most people are having and maybe why they don't invest or maybe why they're delaying investing or maybe why they're nervous about investing right now with all the things going on in the world. So we're going to jump right into that and have a little conversation here around this subject. So hopefully you find it very insightful today. And uh, I really think it's going to be good. And I'm really looking forward to uh, going over those with you today. So um, as always, if you can let me know where you're tuning in from, uh, please go ahead and drop that in the chat. And if you have any questions, we'll make time for Q&A as well around this. So uh, this is all very, very important stuff, but we're going to do our best to get through it as soon as we can and as efficiently as possible. So let's just jump right in here. So why? Why should you invest? Most people will say it's to grow their wealth. You know, they want to invest their money so it should grow so that they can maintain their life goods and services that they like to do today and maintain their purchasing power. And really the big thing is purchasing power because there is this little thing that you may be aware of, this I word called inflation. You know, it was very interesting. I was uh, doing a workshop in a high school not too long ago and I asked them if they knew about investing and what investing was. And not very many people turned up their, uh, you know, put up their hands. But when I said, well, what do you know about money? What do you know about finances? They said inflation, right? So inflation is something that everybody knows about today. And think about how much you might have paid for your first car or house versus your last car or house. These are things that, you know, it's not in your control or my control necessarily. A lot of it's based on government spending, right? At the end of the day, that's what a big part of it is. And as you know, interest rates are going absolutely bonkers right now because the Federal Reserve is trying to bring down uh, inflation to the 2% target level. So uh, rates just went up again, another 0.25%. Many people are expecting that this is going to be the tip where things uh, really stop going up from here, but who knows? And what I want you to think about is who cares? Because you're going to invest in a way that I'm going to share with you. And if you just do it this way uh, and you don't freak out, you're overall going to have um, a better experience. So let's talk a little bit about this. All right. So inflation, you know, what it does is it erodes the real purchasing power of your wealth. So let's take a look here at a quart of milk. Okay. Back in 1920, a quart of milk cost 17 cents, okay? 17 cents for one quart of milk. By 1970, for 17 cents, you got two cups of milk. And as of uh, last year, you got 11 tablespoons of milk for that same price. So inflation is an absolutely real thing and it's not gonna ever stop. To be honest, our system is based on inflation and we want things because, you know, if you have investments, for example, if you own a home, for example, well, the price is gonna go up Ideally, in the future, you can sell it for more than you paid for it and make a profit, right? So there are good things about inflation, but it doesn't mean everything is good. But there's something else that I think uh, maybe some of you are a little more concerned about, okay? So I took this today. So what we're seeing here is the uh, national debt clock, okay? So if you look at the national debt here, this is as of today, okay? We're over $31 trillion, okay? So the national debt is a real problem. And if you didn't know, uh, the government has put you in debt for $94,791. That's how much we basically how much debt we have per citizen right so if we ever wanted to pay off our debt that's what we're going to have to do and by the way um our debt is something that's never going to be paid off so it's not something that i really want you to worry about that our debt being uh is getting paid off i do want you to worry about how fast it's growing it's probably not going to ever stop growing but the pace that it grows uh is a or could be a real problem okay but there are three ways to get out of this okay first way is we can grow gdp if we grow gdp we can potentially you know grow our way out of of debt. And that's what we've done over time, by the way. Uh, number two is increased revenue. So what does that mean? Uh, so if someone can guess what increasing revenue means, I would love to hear that in the comments. But what it means is we need to, uh, the government needs to increase taxes, right? So that more taxes and fees, I should say. So that's the second way to get out of it. And that's going to be on you and me. Uh, and the third way is to discre- to to decrease spending, all right? So decreasing spending is a third option. And it's like, well, is the government ever going to actually uh, decrease spending? It sure doesn't seem like it right now. So, you know, that's something that uh, we may end up doing. We'll see how this thing goes right now. We're having in uh, some debt ceiling talks at this point, and it seems like we're at a stalemate. I know that's a big concern of people, but um, again, neither you or I can do any much about that. So one thing that I do want to remind you of is that inflation doesn't necessarily mean that like the stock market is going to have bad returns and quite the opposite, by the way. So many people wonder like if stock returns will suffer if inflation keeps rising. But here's the good news is that usually stocks do quite well in relation to 
to inflation. So what we're seeing here, these red dots are what inflation was each year. And then the green is the S&P 500 one year real return. So if you look over the years, this is the red dots here. Okay. And as you know, in 2021, we had some massive inflation here, but these green returns are the S&P. Okay. So since 1992, which is the time frame I have here, 1992 to the end of 2021, so it's about 20 years, one year stock returns have fluctuated wildly. But their weakest returns actually occur when inflation is low. So look at this. Some of the weakest returns occur when inflation is low. So, you know, in 23 out of the past 30 years, we saw positive returns even after adjusting for inflation. So over the period I'm showing you here, the S&P 500 posted an average annualized return of 8.1% after adjusting for inflation. So, and the annualized inflation adjusted return of US stocks is 7.3% when you go all the way back to 1926. So history shows that stocks tend to outpace inflation over time. So this could be a very valuable reminder for those of you that are stressing out a little bit about inflation. Um, I don't want you to stress out too much about inflation. Okay, that we have other problems, but inflation is not the main one when it comes to your market returns that you need to be concerned about. Okay. So another thing that I hear people say a lot of times, especially for you new investors, and I invited a lot of new investors to come watch this workshop today. I really hope you're watching if you're relatively new to investing because you're going to get a quite a big education here. And I should let you know, folks, I'm going to try to get this done in about 45 minutes to an hour, but it's going to be, you know, somewhere around there. But that's the goal is to really give you everything you need to know in that amount of time. So, but investing does mean taking risks. So people do say that all the time, but what you have to remember is like not investing means taking risks too. So if you consider the long-term threat of inflation and, you know, you just want to put all your under your mattress, for example, you know, if you don't grow your money, you may not be able to afford the things that you want to afford in the future, right? So how do people grow their wealth? Well, one of the best ways and one of the ways that I personally believe in the most is letting the stock markets work for you. Okay. So most people, you know, most of the retirees that I work with, most of the ones that have hit a million dollar net worth in their lifetime, in one lifetime, have generally two sources of wealth, their home and their market investments. Most people, what they did, they put somewhere between 10 to 20 or more percent of their money into tax advantage accounts like 401ks, IRAs, Roth IRAs, and even taxable brokerage accounts. Uh, I don't know anybody who just saved a million dollars in uh, cash. I have no clients like that. So this chart here shows you the documented growth of wealth over time. And what it's showing you here is if you put a dollar in back in 1926, what that dollar would have turned into by the end of 2021. So, you know, inflation would have made that dollar uh, $16 you could say worth of purchasing power. A treasury bill would have been $22. A government bond would have been $194. The US large cap index, which is the S&P 500, would have been $14,076. And the US small cap index would have been $37,486. So as you can see here, the markets have rewarded people that have invested for the long term. But on the other side of the coin, you know, T-bills, which would be like the uh, US Treasury bills there you're seeing at $22, they have barely covered inflation because inflation would have turned that dollar into $16. You, you take $16 to buy what it took to buy a dollar back in 1926. So US stock returns have far exceeded inflation and significantly outperformed bonds. So, you know, having your money in the markets, especially during times like this is hard to do, but these are the people that win over time because they don't get scared and they don't give up on the markets when things get a little nervous or a little nerve wracking. I could say. So if you're somebody who's feeling very nervous right now and you have all this stuff going on, you know, it's still a good time to keep some of your money in the markets. I really don't recommend you take everything out, okay? Because you're going to miss things and we're going to talk about that in a second. But one thing I want you to take away is that there is a very large world of opportunities. Many people just invest in the S&P 500 and that's all they do. And if you took that, that's about, you know, 40-ish percent or so of the global market and the U.S. stock market is about 59 percent. So even if you just invest in the U.S. stock market, you're only investing in 59 percent of the investable market. So this is something here that, you know, you might be missing out on some opportunities and this last year or this last quarter, I should say, actually the last year as well, international has done better than the U.S. So that's something I really want you to think about. And when you get to the bond side of the market, you know, the U.S. here is about 40 percent and then you have, you know, countries like Japan that are 13, that little tiny islands, 13 percent. So, you know, you want to make sure that you're not only investing in the U.S. markets and you're, you're making sure you take advantage of other opportunities as well. So how do many people invest? Let's think about how a lot of people attempt to grow their wealth over time and what I, this is all common stuff. Okay, I see this all the time, right? First thing they do is they try to predict the future. Okay, they talk about these winning systems. You see these Facebook ads and TikTok right now, folks. For those of you that are on here, I know most of you are, you know, usually older. Okay, my audience is generally around the retirement age. But if you are somebody that's on TikTok, it is unbelievable. 
people how bad the advice is on there, okay? So it's very scary what's going on, but again, you know, um, teach their own, and this is why you need to do your own research before you start investing. But I hear things like this all the time. Oh, my friend has a winning system for picking stocks. You know, this sector sector will continue to advance through the next year. You know, the market is primed for a retreat, like things are gonna go bad. These are things you hear in the media. Uh, people act on impulse, right? So for those of you right now that are stressed about this, this current debt situation, if your investments are not positioned to get through a time like this. We're gonna talk about what to do in this workshop, but you need to think about that because you shouldn't be freaking out about anything short-term like that. And then on the other side, you know, the everyone's making money, I want a piece of action quote there. If you're within five to seven years of retirement, you really should be thinking about getting to a place where you're not quite as aggressive and you're thinking about preservation of your assets because what you don't wanna do is get to retirement and then you have a bad market and now you have to keep working appropriately. So we're gonna talk about that as well. And here's my, uh, you know, if for those of you that are Jim Cramer fans, you know, I heard it on the news, sell this, buy that. There's actually an ETF that they call the inverse Jim Cramer, okay? And if you would have followed that ETF, you would have done a lot better than the markets would have done overall if you just do the opposite of what he says. So these hot tips from your neighbors or your friends that work in the industry, I really want you to calm all that noise because that is not the way to invest and I really don't recommend that. And there's much better ways to do things, which we're gonna talk about. So the, the thing that a lot happens a lot of times though is you just get bombarded by these media articles everywhere you go and now it's with cell phones. It's in your pocket. It's it's just in your ads. It's just all over the place. And you can hear things about it's easy to get rich. You know, that simple plan to have it all. That statement, because I, I use that. Um, I do like having a simple plan. But, you know, it's there's nothing that I would ever want to do outside of like, you know, if we have a global world war type of thing where we are now sitting here and we had, you know, a nuclear bomb drop somewhere, then maybe at that point, okay, what's going to be worth a lot of money at that point is bullets, guns, and bottled water. But even still, even if that happened, it's more than likely not going to be the whole world. And it's more than likely that Google's still going to be, you know, helping you send emails. It's more than likely that Facebook's still going to be a social network that's going to help you, uh, you know, connect with other people. And it's more than likely that Amazon is still going to be delivering packages, potentially somehow, whether it's through drones or robots or some, some other thing. But it doesn't mean that the stock markets are going to go to zero, okay? So, you know, people that are tempted to act on these media messages should really remember that the media is selling entertainment and they're selling commercials, not financial advice. So is investing risky and what is the best way to invest? Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit because I want to give you some data, okay? Here we go. So is investing risky? Let me know what you think. Right? Put that in the, in the comments while I'm doing this. Is investing risky? The answer is, the short answer is yes, it's somewhat risky, but it doesn't mean you need to not invest at all. No, I don't think that's the case. So let's talk about the S&P 500. So on any particular day, any particular day, the S&P 500 may or may not make money, okay? So on any particular day, 53% of the time, you're gonna have a positive, and 47% of the time, you're gonna have a negative, right? That's on a day-to-day. -day. So for those of you that watch the markets on a daily basis, stop it because there's no point to do this, okay? Uh, and then we go to a month. And if we invest our money in the S&P, then on average, you are going to, uh, for any particular month over time, you're gonna have 63% chance of having a positive return and 37% chance of having a negative return, okay? So positive, negative, positive, negative. But then we go over the course of a year and over the course of a year, things look a little better, okay? On any particular year, 75% of the time, you're gonna have a positive and 25% of the time, it's gonna be negative, okay? So you can expect that. One in four years in the S&P are probably gonna have a negative return. So if you know that and you plan for it, you know, it makes things a lot less risky or at least a lot less challenging to accept, you could say. So, you know, how do you make money in the market? Markets. Okay, let's talk about that. So the old way of making money was such. You would, here. If you, if you say this box here is the investable universe of stocks, okay? If this box is the investable universe of stocks, then you'd have, you know, you'd have a few stocks here and it was all about picking the right ones. This is the market timers, okay? Pick the right ones. That's how, you know, people used to do it. And this is what they sold over and over, but we don't really need to do that anymore. There were better inventions created, right? We had mutual funds and ETFs and index funds. So the new way to invest, if you take this as a whole investable universe, is what you wanna do is you wanna own a little bit of everything, okay? You know, own the markets, own the markets, and what do you think I'm gonna say? Be patient. Okay, so we're going away from picking the right ones to owning the market and being patient. 
This is really important because if you're not somebody who's patient and you're somebody who is going to make irrational decisions at all the wrong times, then you really shouldn't be investing or you need to have somebody help you. Okay. And this is where, Hey, and people like me come in an investment advisor that can help guide you, can coach you to help you from making those horrible decisions that potentially could just completely ruin your whole financial picture. Right? So that is not what we want to do. We don't want to be uh, time in the market. We want to own the market and we want to be patient. Okay, so let's dive a little bit more into this here. Okay, so what does it look like to own the market? Well, here's a few examples. This is an example. If you put $1 in the S&P 500, okay, back in 1926, at the end of 2022, after a market downturn, it was higher in 2021, but at the end of 2022, that dollar still would have turned into $11,527. Pretty amazing. But look at this. So many people only invest in S&P 500, but they don't always understand that there are other asset classes. Again, we're going to go into more of this today, but there are other asset classes besides S&P that have returned better over time. Doesn't mean that they're less volatile or that they're better or worse. They're just different. But in this case, we have the small cap index from 1928 to 22 and $1 turned into $41,204. And I think I said 22. Uh, the growth of $1 invested in the small cap index from 1928 to 2022 turned into $41,024. And now when we go to the growth of the small cap value index from 1928 to 2022, that turned into $128,147. That's $1 that turned into $128,147. So Folks, this is why, you know, for those of you that are new, for those of you that aren't investing, for those of you that are sitting on a big pile of cash somewhere that are afraid, you got to think long term because what is going to happen? This could be you, by the way. If you put a dollar in in 1926 and into a one month treasury bill, so you just kept it safe, that dollar uh, as of last year turned into $22. Okay. So your money needs to grow. You need to grow your wealth. And for those of you that came from, you know, lower income backgrounds that may not have the experience and the knowledge to do this kind of stuff, get the help, okay? Reach out to me. We have some new programs to help out people that are just getting started. So please reach out. And for those of you that are older here, if you have children or grandchildren that need some help with this, as long as they're 18, ideally at least working, you know, 25 or 30, we have some wonderful new programs that I'm releasing and I'll talk more about that later. But we want to get more people investing because in reality, if we have more people investing, everyone's going to be better off, okay? So let's really uh, revisit this graph a little bit here, okay? So at the end of 20 2021, the U.S. was 60% of the global stock market. Okay, so as a whole, that's 44,013 companies. So if you're only investing in the U.S. large cap index, which would be the S&P 500, you're only getting 500 companies there. Not great. And as you saw a second ago, the small cap has outperformed over time. Again, it doesn't always happen, but it's, it's happened there. But what we're forgetting about is there is a lot more companies in this world that we can invest in. And actually about 18,500 more between the developed markets, excluding US and emerging markets. So over 18,000 more companies that we could potentially invest in over time. And these are not companies that you haven't heard of, by the way. Uh, have you heard of Toyota and Sony? Those are Japanese companies, right? Uh, have you heard of Nestle? That's a uh, Swiss company. So there's a lot more companies in this world that you can invest in. So only investing in the S&P 500 and missing out on the global investments, that's going to be something that will possibly uh, cause your problem down the road. So let's talk about recessions, right? So for those of you that are, you know, I hear it all the time too. The recession is coming, the recession is coming. My opinion is we're already in here, by the way. So if you look at this graph, this is uh, an example of the S&P 500 index from January 2007 to December 2010. When we look back at the data, this is where the recession happened, okay? So 2007 to somewhere at the end of 2009. This is where the recession was announced. So market is already basically almost all the way down. So the recession was announced and then it you know, hit its bottom and then it started coming back up this way here. But this is when the end of the recession was announced after 2010, after market, the market had done most of its recovery already or a big chunk of its recovery already. So this is the problem with listening to media and why if you have a good investment strategy, you stay globally invested and you rebalance as needed, you're gonna have a much better experience over time than you would if you just one, put it in one asset class, but two, listen to the media, okay? So I'm bashing on the media a lot today and that's okay, you know? It is what it is because I feel like right now, there's a lot of hype and fear going on and I'm seeing it from just like all angles, like, you know, all kinds of media. I mean, it's really in a lot of places. So if you can take these principles and bring them into your world of investing, I really think you're going to be better off. Does that mean the market's not going to have volatility anymore? No, it doesn't mean that. But what it means is over time, you're more likely to do better. And we're going to continue to talk about this. So if you look at this graph here, what you're seeing is all of the recessions in the last century. Okay. We've had 15 recessions in the last century. And in 11 of those instances, stock returns were positive two years after the recession began. So we have the months here, so 24 months. And in all of these recessions here, stock returns were positive 
two years after the recession began. So 11 out of 15, right? And the average annualized return after the onset of the recession was 7.8%, right? So if you put in um, 10% at the top of the market when you know the economy was at its highest point and then we went to a recession, two years later, your account would have uh, on average would have been $11,937. So you would have made almost 20% you know, over that next two years. So the recession thing is, you know, I'm not saying it's not real. I'm not saying things aren't going to happen. I have a bigger concern, a bigger concern about AI, a much bigger concern, I should say, about AI. Artificial intelligence is going to be the craziest thing since the internet was invented, since this, since cars were invented. I mean, it's going to be insane. So this is something I would be more concerned about than people losing their jobs or companies going to zero, I should say. I'm more worried about people losing their jobs that aren't really specialized jobs. So if I were you folks, I would really start learning about AI and a couple cool things to look into or something called chat GPT. Just start playing with it. You can write blogs, you can write books, you can write movie scripts, you can write songs, you can ask it anything, you can write code for computers. I mean, it's pretty amazing, but just start to learn and play with these tools because they're going to be very useful and they're going to be in your life at some point. I mean, for those of you that are retiring, you might get out alive, but for the rest of us that have a while, we need to learn to adapt, not run away from this. Okay. So let's talk about the cost of trying to time the market. So what's going to happen if you think you're somebody that is just, you know, uh, and I've talked to, I say at least half a dozen people in the last few months about this. They said, oh, I don't want to put my money in the markets because the market's too crazy right now. It's too volatile. I don't want to invest. I'm going to keep my money in cash. I said, okay, well, what would it look like if you missed some of the shortest uh, or some of the uh, best periods of returns when the market was volatile or the market was down? Well, if you would have put $1,000 in back in 1997 through 2021, that $1,000, if you just didn't take it out, you just left in the S&P 500, that $1,000 would have ten turned into $10,367. Okay. What if you missed the single best week? Just one one week, the best week of returns. Now you're down to 86.52. You missed the best month. You're down to 82.79. You missed the best three months. Now you're down to 73.08. And the best six months, you're down from $10,000 to $6,728. So folks, you know, again, for those of you that are new investors, this is what I want you to take away from this slide. Once your money's in the markets, never ever take it out. Your only options are to rebalance your accounts or unless you're ready to turn that into income and if you're in retirement. But if you try to time the market and go in and out all the time, this is probably the result you're gonna get, if not worse, by the way. All right, so what this visual is gonna show you is that to be a long-term investor, you need to be comfortable with volatility, right? And if you're not comfortable, this is where having a coach in your corner comes into play. Vanguard does a study and it's called called Dalbar. Uh, there's a company named Dalbar that does a study, but Vanguard publishes this as well each year. Investments, which everybody knows, loves, and trusts, says that the value of a financial advisor for the average investor on increased returns on average is going to be about 3% average per year. That's what you're going to get more by having a good investment advisor guiding you. And that's a multiple of things, being properly invested, optimizing for taxes, optimizing for behavior, and at the end of the day, not making any huge bad decisions. But one thing I, I don't want to sugarcoat for you, because I'm showing you all these big numbers and all these returns is it doesn't mean there's not going to be volatility. Okay. So if you look at these, what this here is the, the bull and the bear market. Okay. So these are bull markets. These are bear markets. We're currently in a little bit of a bear market right now. It's recovered a bit, but that's currently where we're at now. But from 1926 through 2021, the S&P experienced 17 bear markets or a fall of at least 20% from the previous peak. So when you have a 20% fall from the previous peak, that's what a bear market is, right? So we experienced that last year, by the way. So declines range, uh, range from 21% to 80% across an average length of around 10 months. So the average declines are around 10 months. You know, that's pretty normal with, with you know, market ups and downs. But on the upside, there were 18 bull markets so all the 18 total here of the bull markets and the gain uh, or gains of at least 20% from a previous trough, right? So 18 bull markets where the gains were at least 20% from a previous trough. And I think, you know, potentially this year or next year, we're going to be seeing some good gains. That's just what I think, but who knows? They average, the bull markets average 55 months in length and the advances range from 21% to 936% return from the prior down. So when you look at this all viewed together, you know, from a high level, it's very clear that the equities reward the discipline. Because look at the downsides and then look at the upsides, right? So investing in equities is something that I truly believe, you know, not everybody, but most everybody should be doing. If you're somebody that really can't stomach this, then, you know, maybe it's not for you. But for anybody that wants to be wealthy, uh, you should have a portion of all of your income going into equities from everything that you make, right? And that's something that I very much, much so believe that, right? So, but these ups and downs are unpredictable. So the goal is to get a properly diversified portfolio and then don't do anything, 
<laughs> don't do anything stupid. <laughs> like don't pull late your money out at the wrong time and don't make a mistake. All right. So I've covered a lot here on the history of the markets, you know, hopefully overcoming some of your biggest concerns about the markets overall. So let's talk about, you know, where to start. Okay. Where most people should start. All right, the first thing I want you to understand is that there is three stages of investment planning. And there's one stage that I would say maybe 90% of, of people going to retirement are making a mistake. They're making a very potentially critical error by missing this one stage, right? So stage one is accumulation, right? So accumulation is when you're saving money. That's when you're working, you're saving money, you're contributing to your 401ks, your Roth IRAs. And during this time, you know, and I call this, you know, 10 years plus until retirement, it's very okay to have a growth or an aggressive growth type of allocation. You know, it's okay to have a high equity proportion of your portfolio. Nothing wrong with that at all because you have 10 years to go. Once you get below that 10 year mark, you should really be thinking about, you know, taking a different approach. And this is the mistake that most people make or the stage I should say that most people miss. It's a preservation stage. So five to 10 years before retirement, you want to start moving to a moderate or a growth in income type of allocation. And ideally, you want to start putting aside at least a couple years worth of very, very safe assets so that if you were to to retire and the market's down, you're not going to have to extend your working career because you had too much inequities. And remember when I talked about that greedy or, or you know, everyone else is making money type of uh, statement in the earlier part of the presentation. This is where I see a lot of people get, they get really greedy towards the end of their retirement because they think they're going to miss out. But look what happened last year in 2022. Can anybody here be honest and say, Hey, I wanted to retire in 2022, but I didn't because the markets took a dump, right? How many people can say that honestly? Because I know there's a lot, All right? So that's stage number two. And then stage number three, Three is your distribution stage. Okay, so in your distribution stage, you want to be more conservative, maybe some some growth assets, definitely, but you want to have growth in income, right? Because you want to be providing income for yourself. You want to make sure you have enough safe money, but you got to make sure that your money lasts. So you do need some growth allocation, you know, on the back end of that portfolio. So here's how I like to think about it. Three simple buckets, okay? This is what I do for pretty much all my clients, whether you're young and you're just beginning investor. I have folks that are in their 30s and 40s that are investing with me. We do the same thing as I do for people that are going to retirement. The only difference is how much money is in each of these buckets, okay? So what we call these buckets are now, soon, and later, or you can also call them safe, moderate, and growth. But everybody should have money in these three buckets. It's just a matter of how much. You know, if you're somebody who is 32 years old, well, then you probably only need your emergency fund and really safe money, right? And so that's something you can put into like a high yield savings account potentially. Right now they're paying over four, maybe four and a half percent at this point. It's a great place to put that money. You could put it into some short term bonds. That could be something that could be good. But if you're somebody near retirement or in retirement, you want to be thinking about zero to five years of money in this safe bucket. For some people, they need 10 because they're very, very low risk tolerance. But zero to five is going to be a good number for about 80 plus percent of the people that I ever speak with. So this is money you also want to have um, for any sort of near term expenses. So if you're going to buy a house, let's say in two or three years, I don't recommend investing this money. It's hard to say that because I'm a high risk type of person. So I did invest some of the money I was going to be buying a house with and it worked out. Okay. So it can work out. But my guidance and my advice to you is to be conservative because if you're not somebody that can recover from that and feel comfortable with that, you really don't want to be investing any money you need in the next couple of years, right? So from there, any money we don't need over five years, we want to put in our soon bucket. And our soon bucket is really meant to be that inflation hedge because inflation, as we've seen these last couple of years, is it could be a very serious thing. On average, over time, inflation is around two to three percent. It's not a huge deal, so we don't have to be very super risky with this money. But this money, uh, you know, that you need in the next five to ten years or so, this could be something you invest in a more moderate allocation. Okay, so uh, you can put some cash, you can put some bonds, and maybe put a little bit of equities in there, right? So somewhere between twenty to forty percent equities is probably an okay amount for money you don't need five years from now. But again, please uh, speak with your advisor. I should mention here, everything is for educational purposes and not direct advice. But if you don't need the money for five years or more, like I showed you earlier, one in five or one in four years, you're going to have a negative return. But over time, you know, you should do okay in equity markets if you keep some of that money invested. All right. But then bucket three is our later bucket. So our later buckets for 10 years more or more. And this is for the long-term investing. So this is for pretty much anybody, right? Even if you're 30s, 40s, or 50s, you should have money invested very aggressively because you're not going to need it for 10 years or more. If you're somebody who's in retirement now, you know, and you have maybe 10 or 20 or 30 years of retirement left, potentially, you do need 
some money in a growth bucket because again, inflation is a real thing and you don't want to run out of money on the back end of your retirement. So how much you put in the, into these buckets is all going to be very individualized. And this is where you need to have a financial plan that helps you understand how much money should you be allocating to each of these three buckets. You should be saving some into each of the three. And then, you know, I did talk about last week in excruciating detail. So if you didn't watch last week's workshop, you should go back. You want to make sure you're investing the money here and here in the most tax efficient way. Okay. And we have pre-tax accounts where you're going to get a tax deduction today. We have tax-free accounts like Roth accounts where you'll pay taxes today, but then it grows forever tax-free. And then we have taxable brokerage accounts that if you put the money in, you pay taxes when you sell and you'll pay a capital gains rate. So we have three potential taxable buckets put money in and three potential buckets of time-based money or time-based buckets put money in. So here, this is where, again, you got to get a good financial plan and get everything laid out that works for you for your particular particular situation. Okay. Let's go a little bit deeper on the stock market. For those of you that are brand new to investing or, or those of you that may not be, you know, very seasoned investors, I, this pretty much sums up the whole stock market in one square. Or actually I have to say it's like, well, how many squares is this? 10, I guess. Oh, 10. Some, there's some, uh, type of, uh, I think it's 14 squares all in, right? If you put everything in, but anyways, we call this a nine box. Okay. Why is it called a nine box? Because there's nine boxes, right? So when it comes to stocks, We've talked about this a little bit so far. We talked about large companies, right? So the S&P 500 is a large company index. We've also talked about small companies. The um, Russell 2000 is a small company index. And then there's some stocks you know, in the middle here. So this is a representation of the Russell 3000. So that's the Russell 2000 plus S&P 500. So it's all the stocks, all the US stocks, basically. So if you added up all these numbers, these would add up to 100%, okay? So if you look at the US stock market, it has three sizes of companies, right? Small, mid, and large. And then there's three, you could say, styles of stock. We have value stocks, we have growth stocks, and then there's a blend, okay? So there really there's two, there's value and growth. So we're just gonna use value and growth today. And then we're really just gonna use large and small today. So value stocks are companies that are considered to be a cheap price based on their future expected cash flows. Growth companies are companies that are expensive, but they're expected to grow quickly. So what that means is you'll pay a high multiple of their earnings when you're buying growth stocks and value stocks are a better or a lower multiple of their earnings. So, but when you look at this nine box, this is pretty much the whole story stock market wrapped up in, you know, one visual here. So, you know, you want to have some money in each of these different areas, but what does this look like at, at the next level here? So if you took the Russell 3000, which is the total US stock market and you broke it down and we said, okay, well, what's, what's in this? This is what I want. I don't want you to be scared of investing. I want you to be comfortable investing because all you're doing when you're buying a index fund is you're buying a basket of different companies that makes it very easy to own a very diversified portfolio versus buying each one of these stocks separately. If you wanted to have a diversified portfolio and you wanted to buy all these separately, it might take you, you know, thousands of dollars, potentially maybe tens of thousands of dollars to own these companies here. These are just kind of the top holdings in here, but you can buy one share of the Russell 3000 in a ETF for maybe a hundred dollars at this point. I don't know what it is, maybe $130. And you can own, uh, you can, that'll divide this up for you and you don't have to do anything. You don't have to manage it. All you do is buy it and hold it and let these companies do their thing. But if you look at what's in the Russell 3000, here are the top companies. Uh, the biggest one is Apple and that's 5.64%. Microsoft is 4.7. Amazon is 2%. Tesla is 1.4% and NVIDIA is 1.3. Alphabet, which is Google, uh, is 1.36 and so forth. So these are all companies that you more than likely heard of before. So one thing I want you to hopefully walk away from today is investing should not be scary. Investing is something you should feel very comfortable with. It's just a matter of knowing how to start. And again, if you don't know how to start, I'm going to get to that. But I want you to understand that by buying, you know, mutual funds, index funds, or ETFs, you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a stock picker. You're somebody who can go out and do this yourself. But if you want to get fancy, then there are ways to potentially outperform. And those are things we can talk about as well. But, you know, from a high level, if you just go and buy the total US stock market index fund and all these big companies have them, Vanguard has one, uh, Schwab has one, Fidelity has one, it's not going to cost you very much. And you can start to invest today in a extremely diversified portfolio. Okay. So let's talk about a little bit a difference between the S&P 500 and the Russell 3000. So remember the Russell 3000 is the whole US stock market. So it contains the S&P 500, but it also has another 2000 plus companies. But look at the difference between these two when it comes to our nine box comparison. If you look at the large here and large here, you can see that there's more large in the S&P 500, right? These are all a little bit higher than what we're seeing over here. But the S&P has no small cap, where small cap here, if you own the, the, the Russell 3000, there is some small cap there. So this is important because 
over time, you know, the small cap index has done a little bit better than the large cap, but it does, that's not always the case. And what I'm about to show you here is there's no guarantees or anything that this is going to continue, but this is what we call our dimensions of expected returns. So over enough time, these asset classes are going to return similar to what I'm showing you here. But one thing that um, you may not know is that there's certain areas of the stock market. So like I mentioned, small cap versus large cap or value stocks versus growth stocks that perform differently. So even though these companies or these uh, ETFs or index funds may be fairly priced, it doesn't mean that different asset classes don't have different expected returns. Okay. So looking at this chart here, if we look at the S&P 500 over time, over almost a hundred years, you know, 1928 to 2022, S&P 500s were in, returned about 9.85%. The last 10 years, or excuse me, the last 50 years, it's been about uh, 10%. And so very consistently, if you just put money, your money in the S&P, you can expect a 10% return, but there are some problems that could come up. And again, we're going to address this in just a few minutes here, but look at the small cap index. The small cap index has done about 11.84% uh, over time. So that's almost 2% better. And if you look at global stocks and developed markets and emerging markets, large companies in, in uh, the developed markets, which is think about uh, companies like Shell Oil, think about Nestle, you know, those type of companies, they've done about 8.9% return over time. And small company, but international uh, have done about 13.45 over the last 50, 52 years. And when we go to emerging markets, so emerging markets are like Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, you can think Philippines, Vietnam, those type of countries, the large companies there have done about 8.7 and the small companies have done about 11.49 from 19 to 2022. So that's 2.79% return. So me personally, when I'm investing money for clients, I'm going to tilt a little bit extra to the small companies, not a ton extra. And by the way, you should not be putting all the money here. And we're going to cover this a little bit more in just a moment, but these are something that you may not have known about. When we go to value companies versus growth companies, okay? This is the thing. There's famous radio personalities that say, just put your money in growth companies and you're going to do better. Well, growth has done 9.28 and value has done 12.52 over time. So that's a 3.25% uh, spread to the positive for value. Again, if you go international, value's done four and a half percent better over time, and it's done 5% better over time in emerging markets. Profitability is another metric. I'm going to skip that today because that's a little bit more technical and this is meant to be somewhat of a uh, general presentation. Okay, so if you're brand new to investing, I really recommend you consider researching target date index funds. You know, target date index funds are just a really simple way that it's a fund that's designed to automatically adjust its asset allocation over time with the goal of providing a balanced and diversified portfolio. So it's kind of an all-in-one fund. And as you get closer to retirement, it's going to become more conservative for you. So if this is something you want to do on your own, then this is where you, I recommend you, you check out, at least do some research there. Some of the benefits here is number one is simplicity. Very simple, very straightforward. It's a hands-off approach. All you have to do, your only job is to put as much money as you can in your accounts and just let the fund do its thing. Uh, number two is diversification. The nice thing about uh, target date funds versus an S&P is it's going to invest in a broad range of assets. So you're going to have stocks, bonds, cash. It's going to be globally diversified. And so it's going to spread it out and it's going to minimize that risk for you over time. Number three is it's going to have automatic rebalancing. So again, this is a hands-off thing. So me personally, I have a system that rebalances accounts for my clients because we don't use target date funds. We use individual funds. But if you're doing this on your own or you're just getting started, just go to your 401k and look in there and look for target date fund and then pick the one that correlates with either an event you have coming up when you need the money, retirement possibly in the future. So for example, if you're born in 1980, you'd pick the 2045 target market date index fund. Simple. That's all you got to do. What I don't want you to do is pick that and then pick an S&P 500 fund on top of that. I see this all the time where people will pick a target date index fund and then they'll pick four or five additional funds trying to quote unquote diversify. And then all they're doing is messing up, you know, their actual diversification and they're actually concentrating their money and they're adding more risk to their profile without even really realizing it. So if you're somebody who's going to do a target date index fund, this is meant to be an all in one fund. You do not need to have any other funds. Okay. Number four is low cost. And number five is professional management. Okay. They have professional management and that is definitely uh, potentially a good thing if you do have no idea what you're doing. So if you don't know what you're doing, targeted index funds, great place to go. If you're more experienced in, if you're someone who's more experienced and you have some experience in this area, then you might want to consider researching some index funds of different asset classes and building your own portfolio. So here's usnews.com's recommended 10 uh, low cost index funds or ETFs to consider buying. So they have a Fidelity 500 index fund. Um, you know, there's a, a BNY Mellencore bond fund, Vanguard total stock market index fund. So these 
these are some options that you might want to consider uh, in investing in. And like this one here, the Vanguard Total World Index, this is the whole globe all in one, right? This one here is a total US stock market. This one here is a US treasury, so that's your bonds. This one here is more of a dividend focused fund. And this one here is just as another S&P fund. So these are all ones you can consider, right? It might be something you want to consider to build your own if you want to be a little fancier, okay? So now, I'm going to lead you. So for those of you that are beginners, okay, that's pretty much what I have for you. For those of you that are a little more advanced that want to invest in a way that's a little more technical, I'm going to bring you into my world and teach you a little bit about the way I invest and around the markets and how we can tilt your portfolios and we can create a portfolio towards areas with higher expected return in the markets so that you can ideally generate return, better returns over time. Can I guarantee that? No, but history has proven that so far that um, it would have worked out quite well for you. Okay. So before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the differing approaches to investing. The first one is, you know, just somebody's trying to time the market. You're trying to identify mispriced securities. So this is the old Warren Buffett strategy where he would just try to find companies that were underpriced. He learned this from Benjamin Graham. And so this is a strategy that used to work a lot more back in the day. But now with so much information be being out there, it's some crazy number, like $385 billion in stocks are bought and sold every single day. So the amount of information that's out there, it makes it very, very difficult to find mispriced stocks anymore. And this whole idea of undervalued is really just something that is um, very challenging. And then the big thing is you're going to be trading stocks. So you're going to have higher expenses, trading costs, and risks. So you're adding more costs and more risks. So after costs, this is why index funds have been so popular because after costs, it's very difficult to be a stock trader and actually um, outpace an index. It's very, very difficult. So I really don't recommend this at all. Okay. So what we're doing here is, you know, they're looking for buy and sell signals, right? So the red would be the sell signals. The green would be the buy signals. And this would just lead to a lot of turnover over excessive cost, very inefficient way to invest. And if unless you're a professional trader, and even the professional traders, by the way, 90 plus percent of them don't outpace the S&P 500. So what's the point? You know, there's really no point to do that. Okay. Here's number two, indexing. Indexing offers a number of investment benefits over a conventional approach. So if you just buy broad-based indexes, like I was teaching you there, you just buy index funds like the S&P 500, or you buy the Russell 3000, and then you buy the total, you, uh, total international stock markets, and you just own those for 20 or 30 years, you're going to be fine. You know, by doing that, you're going to have no problems. You're going to have lower fees and a more in a transparent investment process. But the problem with this is that there's a commercial index provider that determines the stocks or bonds that need to be held in that portfolio. Okay. And that firm publishes a list usually annually or semi-annually, which contains all the stocks composing that index or the benchmark. So the manager, whoever's managing that index fund ha has to do their best to, to, you know, closely track that benchmark, but the rigid construction, it works against the strategy because most index fund managers are judged by their ability to closely track the index that they're tracking. So by the way, you cannot invest directly into index. You you're going to invest in an index fund. And when you buy an index fund, there's going to be a fee. And in, you know, like Vanguard funds, it's like point oh eight or something like that, or point one. Same thing with Fidelity and Schwab. But the main problems with this approach is that you have a loss of control, a trading disadvantage and style drift. Okay. And the a couple of things to think about are what happened when Ukraine um, was invaded by Russia. You know, the index funds didn't, weren't able to take those funds out of the index right away. So what an index fund is trying to do is match the returns of a commercial benchmark. So it's going to hold the securities and the index manager does not start with the whole market, but with the list of stocks published by the index provider. So the manager, holds this basket of stocks in an attempt to match or closely replicate that list. And then the man, the investment strategy is defined by the commercial index provider. They don't have any sort of ability to make any uh, tweaks to this. So there's actually a really big trading disadvantage to this. And when that new list is released, the managers must buy and sell at the same time to keep their portfolios and returns in line with the index. So this updating process is known as rebalancing or index reconstitution. And everybody knows what the index fund is holding and when the index fund manager is going to rebalance. So that provider has basically shown their cards to the marketplace and that fund manager will have to trade with urgency along with the other managers to follow the index. So basically they're going to pay the highest trading cost possible because they have to trade on a certain day. And so that puts them in a big trading disadvantage and usually at higher costs. The second thing here is you get style drift. Okay. So if you have a particular index, so let's say we're trying to keep things in a small cap index, right? And here's your index list. And remember small cap outperforms large cap over time generally. So your small cap index list, you know, it started where with everything inside this box here, but between that six month or that 12 month period, companies grow and companies change. And so then they get out of the index. 
And so if you're trying to have a properly managed strategy where you're trying to keep your small cap in small cap because you know small cap generally outperforms large cap, well, this style drift can lead to problems for you. So as new information is incorporated into the market prices and securities start to exhibit different characteristics, the index portfolio can move away from its target universe or asset class. So this is referred to as style drift. Okay, so this is what's called style drift and um, it happens in indices between reconstitution dates and this leaves you as the investor to hold the stocks and you may not want to own them. And by the way, this happens when things like, like I said, when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, if you had an international index, they may not have taken those stocks out, you know, right away. And they didn't, by the way, which is why uh, the some of the um, funds did worse than some of the managed funds. That's actually something that happened this last year. Okay, so here's an alternative approach. And this is the way that we approach it. So the way we approach is using funds that are looking at the insights about the markets and returns from an academic research perspective. And then we're going to structure our portfolios along the dimensions of expected returns. And our goal is to add value by implementing research, portfolio management, and trading. Okay. So we apply a different investment approach. It's informed by financial science and the view that market prices reflect all available information. And we also believe that different securities can have different expected returns. So being guided by this, this approach looks to academic research first to gain insight into the dimensions that drive those expected returns and then integrates that knowledge in the strategies designed to be uh, implemented to add value in competitive markets. And I think this is going to be more and more valuable over time because the index fund universe has just gotten so big that I just think there has to be some sort of change coming up very in sometime in the near future. So rather than viewing the market in terms of an individual stocks and bonds, an investment manager can define the market along these dimensions of expected returns to identify areas um, or groups that have similar or relevant characteristics. And then this approach, relying on academic research, you know, we can do internal testing to identify these dimensions, which then point to differences in expected returns. So if you take this as your whole market here and, and you just you know put that as a standard market index, what we're going to do is we're going to tilt a portfolio towards areas with higher expected returns. So if you look this at this chart here, this going from yellow to blue is going toward higher expected returns. So if you think about like an ice tray, that you fill up an ice tray and then you tilt it sideways. And what happens? Some of that water is gonna go into different uh, of those trays. So that's how we're gonna uh, manipulate the portfolios. And research has shown that some markets do have higher expected returns than others. So we're gonna tilt a portfolio towards that area. And in the stock market, the dimensions are size, like I mentioned earlier, small cap versus large cap. So small caps generally outperform large cap. Pri uh, relative price, so that's value versus growth. And then profitability, that's the third one. So high profitability companies generally outperform low profitability companies. So this is how we're going to tilt the portfolio to provide extra value, ideally to give you as an investor you know, higher um, expected returns. All right. So how do we apply this to practical investing? There's three areas. Research. Um, we're going to start with research and we're going to use all the information in current market prices and fundamental data to identify systematic differences in expected returns among those securities. Then we're going to design your portfolio with the target dimensions of expected returns while considering the interactions among those premiums. So we want to make sure that we're staying diversified, we're keeping costs in check, that's really important. And then the third thing is, is there's going to be a daily uh, managed trading process that's going to make sure your portfolios are going to stay in line and that they don't get too far out of line. And that uh, recharacterization is doesn't need to happen once every six months. It can happen on a daily basis and we can use cash flows and uh, dividends and things like that to rebalance appropriately to lower costs over time of that trading. So going back to what I was speaking about when that commercial index um, gets put out for an index fund, here's what's going to happen with the index funds when they recharacterize constitute and they retrade and balance back to whatever the commercial index tells them. There's going to be, you know, 40 days before, not a lot of trading going on. And then on the day of trading, it's going to go absolutely crazy. And so you're generally going to pay the highest cost because you have trading volume that goes up in a very, very short amount of time. And when you're doing that, that causes you as an investor to pay more costs. All in, index funds are still very, very inexpensive. But, you know, over time and depending on which index you're looking at, S&P versus small cap versus international, you know, there, there could be some things that over time add more value by not trading on that particular day when you're able to have more of a flexible process and keep your portfolio balanced to the areas of higher expected return. And so this is the way I want you to think about it. This flexible trading process allows you to, um, you know, pick and choose when the right time is for you to make the purchase of that particular company versus only when the index fund provider is going to tell you when that's happening. So for example, if you're shopping for a car, you know, you may, uh, if you only have one option, you're going to pay the highest price for that option. But if you're flexible and you can wait or get, 
different kinds of cars, you're going to probably get a, the best option for you depending on whatever the market's doing. Very similar with stock prices. Stock prices change quite a bit throughout the day. So by being able to have a managed uh, process and then along with everything else going on in the world, whether it be the bank crisis, whether it be uh, you know Russia invading Ukraine, the managed process can help tilt away from companies that are not doing well, that are going out of business so that over time, you know, ideally we're going to deliver a better return for you. So let's dive a little bit deeper into this. Okay. So as we talked about, um, here are our dimensions of expected returns. First of all, the market premium. We all, I think we can all agree that stock markets can outperform bond markets. We talked about that. What you may not have known is small companies generally outperform large companies, value companies generally outperform growth companies. And I'm going to talk about this now. High profitability companies generally outperform low profitability companies. And this one's uh, one that's very difficult to find a fund that you can invest in. You could probably find value and you could probably find small cap, but high profitability is one that's much more difficult. But as we talked about here, you know, in all areas of the world, so in US stocks, international developed markets and emerging markets, which is the whole globe, these premiums show up across the board over long periods of time. So if you're tilting your portfolio a little bit towards each of these areas, then generally you would expect a higher expected returns, you know, over time. But the hard part is there's no necessary, like there's not a guarantee that this is going to happen in any particular year. So when you look at these premiums on a yearly basis, you can see that, you know, uh, they're going to be quite looking at here is the, when the blue shows up, that means it was a positive. And when the red shows up, that means it was a negative. So the top one here is the market, you know, the S&P 500 versus T-bills. So as you can see, there's a lot more blue than red, but there's definitely red years. It, the one below here, this is our small cap premium. So again, we have periods where small cap is down and then there's periods where small cap is up. Same thing with value and same thing with profitability. This is on an annual basis. So on an annual basis, it's very hard to predict this stuff. And this is the same here in developed markets and international and the same here in um, emerging markets. So again, year to year, very, very difficult to predict. So when we look at, you know, this chart, we're looking at the annual performance of the U.S. market versus T-bills since 1928. The blue bars are showing the years which the U.S. market did an average return above T-bills and the red bars show when it did less than T-bills. So on average, the market premium is very positive. You see a lot more blue than red. Same here around the world. Um, you know, this is in the small cap premium and also in the uh, value versus growth premium. And same thing here in the profitability premium, right? So more blue than red. But what I want you to notice is that over time, these premiums show up a lot more prominently, okay? So what we're seeing here is a rolling five-year period of these premiums. So each of these bars is a five-year rolling period. As you can see, there are times where we have red and red, but then, then a lot of times we'll have some things balance out with blue and blue. But if you look at five-year rolling periods, you see a lot more blue than red in pretty much all these areas. And when you see a little bit of red here, like let's say small cap is underperforming, the next decade is significantly outperformed. And profitability over the course of five-year rolling periods has been a very consistent premium. This is in the U.S., um, markets. When we go to international developed, similar here, you know, a lot more blue than red over five year periods. And again, there doesn't mean there's not gonna be some red like values done bad here in recent times, but profitability has done great. Small caps been a little bit of a positive and the markets premium has been positive as well. Okay. And then this is emerging markets. Again, similar here, a lot more blue than red. All right. So let's go a little further out here and let's look at 10 years. Okay. So 10 years out, you know, it's very, very likely. You can see here, here's the market versus the T-bill. So this means when the market had a positive return. So early 1930s market was negative, but then it was positive for the next, uh, what's that, 40 plus years, had a few years of negative returns. And then it was positive again from 1980 to 2005 over 10 year periods, couple bad years, and that's been positive, you know, ever since, you know, overall over 10 year periods, okay? So 10 year rolling periods are really important because this is what I'm trying to get at with you with like, if you invest money for 10 years or more, it's very likely that you're gonna be positive. And as long as you're invested globally, there hasn't really been any 10-year periods when you're properly diversified where you would have lost money with a global uh, allocation. So hopefully you're finding this interesting, okay? And this is something you may not have known, but um, I wanted to dive into this with you today. Here is our international markets over 10-year periods, a lot more blue than red, and our emerging markets over 10-year periods, a lot more blue than red, okay? So when we look over 10-year periods, you can see here that the blue bars are indicating the years in which the, the U.S. market did it a average return above T-bills, so a positive premium. The red bar bars or when there was a negative return by the markets. So despite the higher performance or the higher frequency of the positive premiums, this outperformance is not 100% consistent. So we need to make sure that we're, again, diversifying properly, you know, for um, our goals and for our time periods. And when we go to small cap, our small cap premium, as you can see here, there's times where small cap is down for a while, but then, you know, prior it was up for a long time and the same thing it was down. So these are not 100% predictable, which is why we need to be investing for the long term and making sure we're looking at it that way. Look at the value premium. It's been 
been positive for almost 1940, a couple years that were bad there, but through 2010, it had a bad decade or so. And then now it's been positive so far, um, I believe in since at the end of 2022, I could be off on that, but uh, I know it was uh, positive the first month and the second month, but I'm not sure where it is today. I didn't look at that. But over time, the value premium has been very strong. And if we look at the profitability premium, this is a very positive thing that we haven't had a 10 year period since 19, you know, mid 1980s or early 1980s with a negative return for um, profitability. So if you're not incorporating all of these premiums into your investing, you potentially could have some challenges. So when we look at the, you know, the last 10 years of premiums of the value premium, I understand that the most recent 10 year here period, it was bad, but it wasn't the worst year by far. And if you look at the amount of positive years versus the amount of negative years, it's a significant difference where again, you know, there's no guarantees, but the data shows us that over time, generally we're going to do better by um, utilizing these premiums. And here's the last 10 years, right? So last 10 years, small's done a little bit worse by about 1.8%. Value's done a little bit worse by about 1.7, but look at profitability, did better by 5.27. This is in the US stocks, I should mention that. International, small did better than large. Value was just a little bit negative, about 0.65, but profitability was positive 2.3. Emerging markets was positive uh, 2.38 for small cap, about break even basically for value versus growth and a positive on the high profitability. So these are very persistent premiums that Again, if you're investing in index funds, you own these companies, but if you're not tilting your portfolios towards these areas of higher expected returns, you could be missing out over time. So to kind of wrap this up here, this is what I really want you to take away, okay? On any particular year, right? On any particular year, this is the US markets. On any particular year, 70% of the time, on a one-year period, the market's gonna have a positive return. Three out of 10 years, you're gonna have negative. Any five-year period, it's gonna be about 80% of the time, 79% of the time, you're gonna have a positive return. Over a 10-year period, it's gonna be 86% of the time, you're gonna have a positive return in the US markets. Value versus growth, over 10 years, it's gonna be about 79% of the time, 70 over five, and 60% over one year. Small cap versus large cap, 69% over 10 years, 60% over five years, and 56% uh, over one year. And then profitability is 92% over 10 years, 82 over five years, and 66 over one year. This is a US markets, okay? So for investing for the long term, it's a very like, good likelihood that we're going to do better by tilting your portfolio towards these areas. Now we go international. 10-year periods, 95% of the time, you're going to be positive. 10-year period for value, 88% of the time, you're going to be positive. 10-year uh, period for um, small cap, 89% of the time, you're going to be positive, and even 83 for for five years. And for profitability, it's been 100% so far over 10 years, 94 over five years, and 69% over one year. And we go to our emerging markets. We have stocks are going to outperform bonds, 84%. 4% of the time over 10 years, 69% value is going to beat growth over 10 years, 95% small is going to beat large over 10 years, and 100% of the time profitability is going to be low profitability over 10 years. So folks, this is um, information that you may not have been exposed to. Uh, this is stuff I go over with my clients. This is one of the first conversations we have about how we invest and why we invest this way. Um, I wanted to do my best to provide you some really good education today to help you learn the basics of the stock market, to stop letting these stupid articles, these stupid news channels freak you out and to consider for yourself, when do you need the money? How much should you be saving? Okay, great. Put it in an allocation that makes sense for you for that particular time period, right? And if this is not something you're comfortable with, this is why we're here, right? You can definitely reach out to us and you know, I'm gonna pull up my website here for you in a moment, but I want you to know that you're not alone. You have someone here you can speak to and we offer complimentary consultations and ideally, you know, if you have an advisor, great, go speak to them and have them help you out. But if you don't have somebody, then, you know, reach out to me. I'm happy to speak with you and and we have some spots right now, not only for our retirement clients, but also for our accumulators, okay? So um, we have a couple new programs that we're gonna be releasing very soon. Actually, they're kind of starting basically, but for people that are still in that accumulation phase where we're gonna just do a membership type fee and we're gonna help you with cash flow and investments and with your uh, workplace benefits and making sure you're on track for financial independence, okay? So if you wanna schedule your wealth strategy call, you can go to keepitsimplefinancial.com forward slash talk and you'll find my calendar page there. You'll be led to an information, a couple forms for information, and then you'll be uh, all set to go. It doesn't take very long to schedule that call. And I do have some times available opening up, but um, we are getting a little bit busier. So I'm gonna take a minute here and check questions. So if you have questions, go ahead and pop those in and I'll do my best to answer those while we are here. And I'll also like to know, did you find this useful? You know, was it insightful? Did you learn something? You know, please tell me, um, you know, what your thoughts are because I would love to know if you enjoyed this. All right, but let's see if we got some questions here, okay? Okay, this is this is what I love. So let's go back to this here. Whoever put this said, this has been really good and easy to understand. I appreciate that. That's what my goal. I know towards the end, we got into some technical information, okay? I 
do understand that, but I wanted to go beyond the basics, but hopefully the basics could at least help you feel comfortable. But thank you so much for that comment. I really appreciate that. Okay, so let's see this one here. That's a long one. All right, normally I take a t long 10 approach and I don't sweat the everyday stuff. However, since I'm retirement, but not planning on drawing Social Security to 70, the potential ceiling fiasco on the stock market has me worried. The media is saying the markets could crash 50%. Yes, it's the media, but the stock markets do react to perceptions, valid or not. So somewhat valid, okay? Because what I understand is the stock markets are pricing in every, all known information every single day, right? So things like inflation or things like the national debt, those are already priced into the stock market, right? So could it take a dip? Sure. But whatever the particular um, beliefs are and whatever the data is telling us could be possible. But whoever put this here, I want you to know that if you follow my three bucket strategy and you put five years of money aside and you don't have to touch any of your money for at least five years, you're going to ride out things like this debt ceiling thing. You're going to ride out things like this inflation thing. So that's what I would say to you if you're sweating it, um, is to actually properly set up your investment portfolio so that you are um, allocated appropriately. All right, let's see what else we got here. Okay, very insightful. Probably one of your best trainings yet. Thank you so much. I wanted this to be good. And what I want this to be, folks, uh, if you're in our Facebook groups, I'm gonna uh, we're going to have this edited and it'll be inside of our Facebook group for you to watch at a later time and really um, in like good quality. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm having everything edited and put in there because I want when people come in to just get this really good education so they can stop freaking out and make better decisions. But um, thank you so much for that, whoever said that. I really appreciate that. Um, Sherry said helpful, especially the first part. Thank you, Sherry. You know, I know the second part is a little bit um, technical, but this is the thing, folks, is like, you know, you can invest on your own, do it on your own, no problem. But I think there's a better way. And if you want to have some assistance and get a little bit more technical and ideally uh, have a better outcome, then that's what I'm here for. But, but you don't have to do that. All right. So I got a question here. All right. So last one, I think. So good info and thanks. Um, I had planned to stay 80-20 allocation even into retirement. My thought is that I can do this since my stable income stream can't cover my expenses. Your thoughts? Listen, this is all about risk tolerance. Okay. So there are a lot of things that will say, okay, what should your stock allocation be? It should be your age, my um, a 100 minus your age. So if you should be at a 60-40. Or there's some people that say it should be 120 minus your age. So if you're 40 years old, you should be at 80-20. I don't really subscribe to any of that. I subscribe to my bucket philosophy. And so what that means is I'm going to look at what, how much expenses does my client need in the next two to five years? Okay, great. We're going to keep that money safe. What are their expenses planning to be the next five to 10 years? Okay, great. We're going to keep that money in moderate. And then any money we don't need for 10 years or more, then that can be in growth. And for someone like you, maybe you don't need a lot of money and you can just live off your pension and social security. That's a lot of people, by the way. I see that quite a bit. So I think that will probably be fine. My concern for you would be how are your taxes going to look later down the road? Should you be looking at converting some of that money today to Roth account brackets or lower than when they're higher after 2025 and maybe when you have a required minimum distribution in the future, right? So that's what I would put to you is um, for your particular situation, but really good question. And I think this is very individualized and that's why I don't subscribe to anything that's of like the 4% rule. I don't subscribe to 120 minus your age. I don't subscribe to any of that. I subscribe to working with the individual client and helping them design a plan based on their particular goals and needs. So really good question though. If you enjoyed this folks, please share this with somebody. Please uh, tag somebody you know in this post. If it's inside the Facebook groups, by the way, you're not gonna be able to share it or tag anybody. You have to go to my Facebook page because that's public. The, pro, the groups are private, but please invite your friends, you know, invite somebody, you know, can benefit from this information to come and watch this workshop. And if you're somebody who's watching this and you're saying, you know, Jason, I want some help. I think there's a better way. And I want you to help me out with that. And you want to get your whole plan together. You want to look at tax planning, distribution planning, like Roth conversions, or when to take money out from which account the best way how to time your pension, your social securities, and put your whole plan together. Or if you're a young wealth accumulator and you're just like, I don't know what to do, Jason, I need help, go to my website, keepitsimplefinancial.com forward slash talk. It's complimentary, the consultation. And if I can help you, I'll let you know. And if I can't help you, I'm gonna let you know that as well, okay? So folks, that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much. I wish you a wonderful afternoon. We'll see you next time. All right, talk to you soon. Bye now.